الحمد لله رب العالمين وافضل الصلاة وتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وفقها في الدين يا رب العالمين اللهم افتح علينا برحمتك اللهم افتح علينا بحكمتك وانشر علينا برحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Tonight, inshallah, we're studying and reflecting upon the story of one of the honorable prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the prophet honored by being mentioned by name four times in the Quran and mentioned by his name and title in six positions in the Quran. His story was mentioned uh, in four different places and referred to in two, four different places in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and yet he was also honored by naming a whole surah after him and that is Prophet Yunus alayhi salam Surah Yunus is the 10th surah of the Quran Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah al-Safat said وَإِنَّ يُونُسَ لَمِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ Indeed verily Yunus and as also known in the West as Jonah, uh, because the story of Yunus is also reported uh, to the people of the book, although the main reference for us has to be the book of Allah, the Quran. So Allah says in the Quran, Surah Al-Safat, وَإِنَّ يُونُسَ لَبِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ Indeed, verily, Yunus was one of the messengers. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of the story of Yunus, speaks of what we take out of the story of Yunus as ibra, as a lesson, as a recommendations for the callers for the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also reminding the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with the story. And we will see how that goes into play during the seerah, the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The story of Yunus Alayhi Salam, that, and it's really a, a simple story, and we know one aspect of the life of Yunus Alayhi Salam is that one particular incident with his people. And the rest of the life of, the, of Yunus Alayhi Salam is not known to us. The details of his da'wah is not known to us. And that is the tradition of the Quran that Allah brings to us what we need, what we need to, to understand and how we can derive the lessons from, from certain incidents and all the other details that will not be of great benefit to us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala omits from the, uh, from the story itself and it's not mentioned. The story of Yunus alayhi salam, that he was in his people and he called to the way of Allah and he was harmed and he was rejected like many of the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Until came a point that Allah warned Yunus that within a certain amount of time, and according to the majority of the scholars, is within three days, those people will perish. Those people will be afflicted by the torment of Allah, just like the people of Ad, the people of Thamud, the people of Nuh, the people of Shu'aib, and many of many of the messengers that we have reflected on their stories and Allah told us their stories in the Quran. At that point, due to the immense rejection that Yunus alayhi salam was facing and the anger that he felt in himself and the frustration with his people, he decided to leave his town and leave his people to their destiny. That they have earned themselves, that they have deserved the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we saw in every other story how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would instruct the prophets about when to leave. You remember when we said, when we recited and, and reflected upon the story of Lut, that Allah said for Lut to leave at night, gave them the proper point, the proper time to leave his, his village. We reflect upon the story of Musa, 
Leave at night, leave at that certain time. So leaving the town that Allah sent the messenger to has to be an order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Prophets are held to a very high standard of obedience to Allah. They don't improvise. They don't make ijtihad, you know, make their own deal unless it is a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Yunus alayhi salam, in this particular situation, he made his own decision. And in anger and in frustration as the revelation to him was the punishment is coming. And that to him, according to his understanding, was the end of his da'wah. It's over. But we will see it's not over until Allah says it's over. Allah changes what, whatever he wants. And Allah makes any decision he wants at any time he wants. But Yunus alayhi salam rushed out of frustration and anger into leaving his village. Ran away from it. And we see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the story in the most beautiful words as we recite them in Surah Al-Safat. وَإِنَّ يُونُسَ لَمِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ إِذْ أَبَقَ إِلَى الْفُلْكِ الْمَشْحُونَ The translation of that when he ran to the loaded ship. Now the word أَبَقَ أَبَقَ in the Arabic language means to run away. And it's usually for runaway slaves. Usually it's used for runaway slaves. For slaves that leave their master without his permission and go on their own and go on their way. And in that is a clear reference from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is when you work for Allah, you take the commandments of Allah. And you don't run away without the permission of your Lord. We are all slaves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And our life should go according to the commandments of Allah. And when Yunus alayhi salam left the, the village or left the town, Abaqa. Allah used that particular word. It, all, it means he ran away, he left hastily, but it also means it's if a slave leaves the, the, the dominion of his Lord, trying to leave and, and run away from the service of his Lord. So Yunus alayhi salam abaqa. He left his town. Into a very heavily loaded ship. And mashhoon is a word to, to emphasize that that ship was full. And that plays into the story itself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves his obedient and righteous servants. And when Allah puts them to the test, Allah is disciplining us in that. But when it comes to the non-believer, it's a sort of punishment. So we need to understand how Allah works with his righteous servants. And the prophets like we see in all of these stories, are again held to a very stringent criteria, to very high standards in their servitude to Allah. So now Allah is showing us how he is teaching Yunus, teaching humanity and teaching the prophets after Yunus how to, how to behave in such a situation, how to, to react to the absolute rejection and an order from Allah, a commandment from Allah that the torment is on the way to your people. So he ran away and he jumped on that ship that was completely loaded. And according to different narrations, the that load and, and that ship went on into the sea. And it was two different narrations, but they basically end up in the same way. That either the ship became too heavy to float across. And the people of the ship known, knew that we need to, to unload. So after they unloaded their goods and anything that is not necessary, it was still heavy. The ship was still heavy and it was at a danger, at a risk of sinking. So they said now one someone has to leave the ship. The human cargo has to be reduced. And how do they do that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Fasahama. They threw the lots. They cast the lots. Said, you know, let's, 
what we say in this uh, culture, let's flip a coin or, you know, uh, what do we uh, say, pull the sticks or whatever. One would end up with the short stick, right? It's the one that has to, to do what, what not, nobody else wants to do. Well, it's a similar situation. Allah said, Fasahama. So they had to, to throw, to, to cast the lots. Fakana min al mudhabin. And the narration that it was, it, it, they did it three times, and every time it happens that it was Yunus alayhi salam. It's to him. He knows who, who handles, who, who controls those lots. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, the, the, the beauty of the Quran, Allah said, al mudhabin. Mudhadin can mean two different things, and they're both meanings are very appropriate to the to this uh, particular story. Dahada, hujjatun dahida. Dahada means something that falls apart or falls down, and it also if something slips down into either a mud or water. So that's what exactly happened to Yunus alayhi salam. Kana min al mudhadin. He was the one that would be cast into the water, and he accepted his destiny. Now Yunus is understanding the lesson that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sending his way. And then Allah said in Surah Al-Safat, فَالْتَقَمَهُ الْحُوتُ وَهُوَ مُدِينٌ Then as he fell down into the water, a big fish or whale. Al-Hut in the Arabic language can mean either way. And Yunus alayhi salam is, lay, is uh, nicknamed or known in the Quran as Sahib al Hut, the one of the Hut. And we know in, in Surah Musa, in uh, the story of Musa in Surah uh, Al Kahf, it, it, the word Hut refers to a fish, that it was their dinner. Their dinner was not a whole whale, obviously, it was a fish. But the Arabic language does not distinguish between a sizable fish and the actual whale. So al-hut means a big fish. So a huge fish swallowed Yunus alayhi salam. فَالْتَقَمَهُ الْحُوت وَهُوَ مُلِيمٌ And mulim meaning he is worthy of blame. And Yunus alayhi salam known that. That he was worthy of blame because of what he did. Because he left his town, he left his people, Although the commandment of Allah has came to him to warn him that the punishment is coming within the three days, but yet he was not given the clear commandment to leave the village or leave the town. And so he was worthy of the blame of his Lord. He was blameworthy as he was swallowed by the Huts. So then what happens? How does the Prophet of Allah, the great Prophet of Allah, Responds to this test, to this trial that he is put through. Now he is in darkness upon darkness upon darkness. It is the darkness of the whale, the darkness of the sea, and the darkness of the night. And on top of that, the darkness that he feels because of what he has done. Allah in Surah Al Anbiya said, Describes the situation of the Noon, which is another name of Yunus alayhi salam. When he left, went off in anger. Now, the word Mughadiba is different from the word Ghadiba. You can say in the Arabic language, angry. In English, there's really no, no two translations for that one word. For the two words. Ghadib means he's, you're angry with something. Mughadiba means something made you angry. Your anger did not come from within yourself. It is an outside force that made you angry. It is a reaction. And the reaction of his anger was to the rejection of his people despite all the warning that he has given them. All the da'wah that he has given him, all the calling, all the, the signs that he was putting forward for them, and yet they would still reject him. Until the very final moment. And then he was very frustrated with them. And he just left them. Now no one should think that anyone is above that reaction. It is really 
not so unnatural. But for the Prophet of Allah, like I said, it is, they are held to a very high standard. They have a different mission. They have different set of behavior that we have. But Allah said, ذَهَبَ مُغَاضِبًا فَظَنَّ أَلَّا نَقْدِرَ عَلَيْهِ And he thought, within himself, he thought and he imagined that Allah will not put his destiny over him. He will not be punished. If Yunus thought that Allah will punish him for what he has done, he would never laugh. This is what Allah said. He did not think. And in here, it's a very clear sign and very clear lesson for us to avoid what? Anger. Anger blinds judgment. Anger makes people do things that they don't want to do. And clouds our thinking. Allah said, ذَهَبَ مُغَاضِبًا He was in a state of anger, so he did not even think. فَظَنَّ أَلَّا نَقْدِرَ عَلَيْهِ he did not think about what the punishment can be and what he was actually doing. And it only hit him, or he thought about it later on. When he, became, when he fell into the darknesses. And he thought that we shall not punish him, that the calamities which has fallen on him. So we answered, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, then he started crying out to his Lord. That's the response. When, when a slave of Allah falls in a calamity, falls in an awkward situation, falls in a hardship, where do you turn? Now where is, where is he getting his punishment from? From Allah. But where do you turn? To Allah. You can't run away from Allah except you run to him. Even in a state of sin. This is another lesson for us. There is no refuge, there is no shelter from Allah except with Him. So if we are in a state of sin, and we are frequently, speaking of myself, in a state of sin, where do you go? You go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then you pray before your Lord. You supplicate before your Lord. You repent to, the, to Allah. Now, taba means to come back. The word taba in, in the root of the language itself, anaba, and taba means to come back, literally. So whenever we feel that we are drifting away, drifting astray from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have to come back. And we can't come back anywhere else other than back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how does he pray? How does he supplicate? He gives this beautiful dua. La ilaha illa anta subhanak. Inni kuntu min al-zalimin. La ilaha illa anta subhanak. Inni kuntu min al-zalimin. La ilaha illa anta subhanak. Inni kuntu min al-zalimin. Oh Allah, there is no wor there is none worthy of worship except you. You might be exalted. Subhanak. Subhanak is to you are above and beyond, and you are exalted and elevated above anything, any association with you. And in the if you go to the to the language and it says that this subhan is a very specific word. And it means Allah is exalted from a sharik, from association, from any partners. And he is exalted and above any sahiba, meaning a spouse, or a child. And there is nothing unlike, nothing like him. So, la ilaha illa ant, subhanak, inni kuntum nazalimeen. I indeed was among the transgressors. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the verse that immediately follows says, فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ وَنَجَّيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْغَمْرِ So we answered his call and delivered him from the distress, from the calamity that he was in. And the ulama, the scholars differ about how long Yunus was in the belly of, in the stomach of the whale or the big fish. 
Some say a day, some say three days, some say 18 days, and some say up to 40 days. But he was there for quite a bit of time. Now think about it. This is complete sensory deprivation. You, know, you, you hear about that in the, you know, in, in, in the world of torture, right? And the torment. When you put someone with complete sensory deprivation, it is a very hard thing to be in. So Allah says he was in the bulumat, darkness upon darkness upon darkness. He could not see a thing. Now in that belly of the whale, in the depths of the sea, of the depths of the sea, he could not hear anything. And the only thing he can touch was the acidity of the stomach of the whale. It's a very harsh position to be in. So that was gham. It was a distress of the situation he was in. And yet for the righteous person, for the heart of the believer, it tops it all the distress of being in violation of the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just being in a state of sin. Just being Allah is not pleased with me 100% at this point. That is gham. That is, a, that is quite a bit of distress. That brings a lot of sadness and sorrow to a believing heart. If you love someone, you don't want them to be not happy with you. So how about the greatest love of all? The love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if the heart of the believer feels that Allah is not happy with them, at this point Allah is not pleased, that is gham. That brings sadness, sorrow, and darkness to the heart of the believer. So he turns to Allah. لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين. And Allah said, فاستجبنا له ونجيناه من الغم وكذلك ننجي المؤمنين. We have saved him from that distress, and thus we do deliver the believers. That turns in the same way. In the hadith that is narrated in Musnad Ahmad and Sinan al-Tirmidhi, both hadith are narrated on the authority of Sa'd ibn Abi Waqaf, one of the ten people that are given the glad tidings for paradise. Sa'd said in a long hadith, and the hadith starts that Uthman ibn Affan was in a state of complete trance where he was... Sa'ad gave salam to Uthman and Uthman did not answer so he asked him about that and he said the Prophet وسلم, started giving us a dua and then an, a Bedouin, an Arab Bedouin came and he distracted him so I did not get the dua and I kept thinking of my head what, you know, he wanted to know the dua so Sa'ad said to Uthman I know the dua because I followed the Prophet وسلم, and I asked him about it and the Prophet said da'watu zin noon it is the supplication, the supplication that I was trying to teach you is the supplication of Yunus, the noon. The noon is huwa fi batni al-hut, when he was in the stomach, in the belly of the whale. La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al-zalimeen. Fa innahu lam yad'u biha muslimun rabbahu fi shay'in qat illa stajabala. There is no one Muslim that would ask Allah with this dua unless Allah will answer the dua for. When that dua comes from within the heart and mean every word you say to Allah in sincerity and truthfulness, the Prophet says that that dua will not be turned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the second hadith in the Tirmidhi basically means the same thing. What did Yunus supplicate with? La ilaha illa ant. Subhanak inni kuntu min al this is not a simple dua. It is simple to say, and it's easy to memorize, but it means a lot. It has a lot of heavy value in it. The first thing is tawheed. You approach Allah with the most important value we have. That is, la ilaha illallah. Emphasizing, la ilaha illallah. I have no Lord but you. I have no deity but you. I have no one to turn to but you, ya Allah. La ilaha illa anta subhanak. You are exalted. You are glorified. 
the value of tasbih. Abu Huraira radiallahu an said, Man qala hina yusbihu wa hina yubsi, subhanallahi wa bihamdihi mi'ata marra, lam yati ahadun yawm al-qiyamati bi afdala mimma jaa bih, illa ahadun qala mitla ma qala au zada alayhi. Abu Huraira said, the value of tasbih is so much that whomever says, subhanallah wa bihamdi, a hundred times a day, ten times, to, you know, twenty times after each prayer, hundred times a day, can do it one time, can spread it apart. No one in the day of judgment will bring better deeds than that, that person that brings to Allah. And in a famous hadith, the Prophet wasallam said on the authority of Abu Huraira, kalimatan, khafifatani ala lisan. There are two words, two phrases that are easy on the tongue to say. They're weighty and they're heavy in the scale of good deeds on the Day of Judgment. They beloved, these two phrases are so beloved to Allah, Ar-Rahman. What are these two phrases? Subhanallah wa bihamdih. Subhanallah al-Azim. Subhanallah wa bihamdih. Subhanallah al-Azim. Subhanallah wa bihamdih. Subhanallah al-Azim. The Prophet said in another hadith on the authority of Abu Huraira, la an aqool, subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illa Allah, wallahu akbar ahabu ilayya mimma talat alayhi shams. If I just can stood and make tasbih, say subhanallah, alhamdulillah, La ilaha illallah, and Allahu Akbar, it's more beloved to me than anything in this world. Anything that the sun would rise upon. And in another hadith on authority of Jabir, the Prophet said, Man qala subhanallah al-azim wa bihamdih, whoever says subhanallah al-azim wa bihamdih, urisat lahu nakhlatun fil jannah. A tree, a palm tree in jannah will be planted for that person. Meaning, you're already establishing your, your, your roots in jannah by making tasbih to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Yunus alayhi salam emphasized tawheed, made tasbih, and then the third thing submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inni kuntu min al And admitting the guilt. Admitting the guilt before Allah helps in this dunya. And it doesn't help in the akhirah. Now in the akhirah everybody is a believer. Qalu rabbana amanna. Everybody, when they see the hellfire, they say, Rabbana amanna. Oh Allah, we believe. And they even admitted their guilt. They admitted all their sins. In Surah Al-Milk, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَاعْتَرَفُوا بِذَنْبِهِمْ They admitted all their sins. فَسُحْقًا لِأَصْحَابِ السَّعِيرِ It doesn't help at that time. But in this dunya, it does help. And that's why Umar ibn Khattab says, you always have to review yourselves. Always be, be in a state of of Put, taking yourself into accountability before you stand before Allah and He will take you into accountability. Answer to yourself every day when you put your head on a pillow, what did I do today? What are the good deeds? How much time did I waste? What are the bad deeds that I did today? And how can I do better tomorrow? That's what Umar and Khattab used to do every night. And he was Umar. You know? And we definitely are more needy to be doing that than Umar radiallahu anhu. This is a beautiful hadith and a beautiful dua that I think every Muslim should really know and should try to memorize if possible in the way that the Prophet said it. And if it's not possible, at least understand the meaning of the dua. The dua is called Sayyidul Istighfar the master of gaining forgiveness of Allah. And it is narrated in, in a very authentic narration in Sahih al-Bukhari, Musnad Ahmad, and Sinan al-Tirmidhi. So the hadith is really a solid hadith. And we know the Prophet, inshallah, made that dua and taught it to his ummah. This is on the authority of Shaddad ibn Awsim radiallahu anhu an al nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam annahu qaa. سيد الاستغفار أن يقول العبد اللهم أنت ربي لا إله إلا أنت خلقتني وأنا عبدك وأنا على عهدك ووعدك ما استطعت أعوذ بك من شر ما صنعت أبوء لك بنعمتك علي وأبوء لك بذنبي فاغفر لي 
إِنَّهُ لَا يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ إِلَّا أَنْتَ The Prophet continues to say, مَنْ قَالَهَا مِنَ النَّهَارِ مُوْقِنًا بِهَا فَمَاتَ قَبْلَ أَنْ يُمْسِي فَهُوَ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ وَمَنْ قَالَهَا مِنَ اللَّيْلِ وَهُوَ مُوْقِنٌ بِهَا فَمَاتَ قَبْلَ أَنْ يُصْبِحْ فَهُوَ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ The translation of that beautiful dua of the Master of Forgiveness, Allahumma anta rabbi, O oh Allah, you are my Lord. La ilaha illa ant. None has the right to be worshipped by you. You see the correlation and how this dua parallels La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntum na zalimin, the dua of Yunus alayhi salam. First starts with tawheed, submit to Allah. You are my Lord, I have no Lord but you. You are my God, I have no God but you. You are the only deity worthy of worship. خَلَقْتَنِي وَأَنَا عَبْدُكَ You have created me and I am your slave. I am, I belong to you. إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا لِهِ رَاجِعُونَ Because sin is a musibah. Sin is a disaster, it's a calamity. When we disobey our Lord and our Creator. And we have to remind ourselves with the famous thing that we say when we have our kids with a calamity. إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا لِهِ رَاجِعُونَ We are to Allah. And to Allah is our return. And you say, أَنَا عَبْدُكْ أَنْتَ خَلَقْتَنِي وَأَنَا عَبْدُكْ You are, you created me. And I am your slave. وَأَنَا عَلَىٰ عَهْدِكَ وَوَعْدِكَ مَا اسْتَطَعْتْ I am indeed faithful to my covenant and my promise to you as much as I can. There is an admittance of what? Of weakness here. Two things, that I am committed to you. I'm committed to the promise of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. I am committed to obedience, but I'm weak. And I fall into weakness. And we say that sincerely before Allah. Mastata'at. Allah said in the Quran, Taqullaha mastata'atum. Have piety, have taqwa to Allah as much as you can. وَأَنَا عَلَىٰ عَهْدِكَ وَوَعْدِكَ مَا اسْتَطَعْتِ أَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنْ شَرِّ مَا صَنَعْتِ I seek refuge with you from all the evil I have done. And there is that submission to Allah. The parallel for the dua of Yunus, إِنِّي كُنْتُمْ نَظَالِمِينَ I have indeed became one of the transgressors, or I was indeed one of the transgressors when I did what I did. And then you say, Abu ulaka bi ni'matika alay. I confess and I submit your bounties and your favors upon me. So you are not Abdun Jahid. You are not a slave to Allah that does not recognize the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abu ulaka bi ni'matika alay. Wa abu ubi dhambi. I submit to you your bounty upon me and I confess my sin. فَغْفِرْ لِي Forgive me. Bestow your forgiveness upon me. Entreat. So I entreat you to forgive my sins. إِنَّهُ لَا يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ إِلَّا أَنْتِ Because you are the one for nobody can forgive sins except you. This is Sayyid al-Istighfar in Islam. And Rasulullah said, whoever said that in the daytime, muqinan biha, in a state of yaqeen, absolute belief, belief un, that with, with not one per million of doubt, believing in those words, meaning what you say to Allah. He said, man qalaha min al nahari muqinan biha, fama ta qabla an yumsi dakhal al jannah. Whoever said that and in the daytime and dies before the night comes, enters into paradise. And whomever say it at night and never wake up to live another day, he will also enter paradise. So it is very beautiful habit to say it in the time when we wake up in the morning and just before we go to bed. This is a dua so worthy of knowing and understanding and memorizing. Yunus alayhi salam turned to Allah with that with a similar meaning in the dua. لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين. There is no Lord but you. سبحانك. You might be exalted. 
إِنِّي كُنْتُ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ I was of the transgressors. That reminds us very clearly with the dua of whom? Another righteous prophet of Allah that sinned before Allah. Adam. When Adam wanted to ask forgiveness of Allah, what did he say? رَبَّنَا إِنَّا ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا وَإِنْ لَمْ تَغْفِرْ لَنَا وَتَرْحَمْنَا لَنَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ رَبَّنَا You are our Lord. You always turn to him and you say, You are my Lord. You are, I'm, I'm your slave. I have nowhere else to go but to you. Show humbleness. Show humility. Show shame with what you have done. We are all sinners. Every single son of Adam is a sinner. But how, this is how we go back to Allah. And this is what Adam said, رَبَّنَا إِنَّا ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا We truly have been transgressors against ourselves. فَغْفِرْ لَنَا So forgive us. وَإِنْ لَمْ تَغْفِرْ لَنَا وَتَرْحَمْنَا If you don't forgive us and have mercy on us, we will be of the losers. We have nowhere else to go. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Safat. فَلَوْلَا أَنَّهُ كَانَ مِنَ الْمُسَبِّحِينَ Had he not done that, had he not been of those who glorify Allah. And the ulama had two different opinions about those, this particular ayah, and the both opinions are valid, according to the majority of the ulama. That Yunus kana min al musabbihin, he was of those who have to, to, to continue, have continuous remembrance of Allah, tasbih of Allah, and the word tasbih also comes at the meaning of salah. That Yunus didn't only do that, in the belly of the Hud. He used to do that all the time. He used to do that before. He used to do that all his life as a prophet, as a slave of Allah. تعرف على الله في الرخاء يعرفك في الشدة. Remember Allah in good times, He will know you in hard times. Remember Allah when you are in a good time. In times of prosperity, in times of wealth, in times of health. Take advantage of five before another five hits you. Take advantage of life before death. Take advantage of youth before elder old age. Take advantage of your health before your sickness. Take advantage of your time before you get busy. That's what that's what we need that's what Yunus did. He was min al musabbihin. He was of those who made tasbih and remembrance of Allah. And when he got into this predicament, Allah knows him and Allah remembers him. In one hadith that is um, a weaker hadith, but, but it's really good and it's narrated by Ibn Kathir and Al-Tabari and many of the Mufassirin in their uh, remembrance of Surah Yunus and their reflections on Surah Yunus. That when Yunus alayhi salam started praying and supplicating and saying, La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al-zalimeen. The angels of Allah heard the supplication below the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they said, Ya Rabbi, sawtun ma'roof. We recognize this voice. This is a voice that we used to always hear. Because when we make dua, it reaches Allah. And the malaika become witnesses on our dua, on our remembrance, on our dhikr, on our tasbih. The angels of Allah are witnessing all of that. They are hearing all of that. They are recording all of that. So when Yunus alayhi salam made his tasbih, the malaika, the angels of Allah around the throne of Allah, said, "We, this is a known voice to us, but it's weak. It's like coming from depth, from far away. It's all, it's a muffled sound in the belly of the hut, in the depth of the sea. And then Allah said, Ama ta'rifuna thalik? Did you not recognize that? And they said, Ya Rabbi, woman huwa? Oh Allah, who is it? Qala thalika abdi Yunus. That is my slave, Yunus. They said, Abduka Yunus, alladhi lam yazal yurfa'u lahu amalun mutakabbal wa da'watun mustajaba. Is that the same Yunus that always has the good deeds that you accept and the supplications that you respond to? And they said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, yes. And they said, Ya Rabbi, awala yurhamu bima kana yasna'u fi al-rakha min al-bala. 
Would he not receive mercy for what he was doing during the times of rakha, during the times of, of health, during the time of prosperity, during the good times? That you might save him from this calamity that he is in. And Allah said, Bala. Yes. So Allah ordered the whale to take him out. So Allah said, had he not been of those who made the spear, whether you take that as a, a, a good habit of a believer that he always used to make tasbih, make qiyam, make remembrance and dhikr of Allah, or he was doing it in the belly of the hood, of the fish, Allah said, لَلَبِثَ فِي بَطْنِهِ إِلَىٰ يَوْمِ يُبْعَثُونَ He would have stayed in the belly of the, hood, the, the fish until the day of judgment. Very high standards for the prophets. And when Allah disciplines them, they are disciplined in a really strict way. That's what you, if, if you are, you know, p people who teach know this. If one of your best students made a mistake, even if it was a smaller mistake than other students would probably make, it will get your attention. The similitude is only best with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it, it becomes more evident and more obvious. In the Middle East they say, غلطة الشاطر بألف. You know, the, the mistake of the good student is multiplied a thousand times. And so the discipline of Allah, he said, he would have stayed in the belly of the hut until the day of judgment. That was what was ordained for him, had he not been of those who make tasbih and make istighfar and make remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah said, but we cast him forth on a naked shore, on a barren shore. فَنَبَذْنَاهُ بِالْعَرَاءِ So the whale let him out on a barren shore, there's nothing there. His skin is in bad shape from the acidity of the whale. And here's the sun, and he's got no shade. Now this is a very hard situation. You know, if you have first degree burns, if you ever were burned with the sun or something else, and you expose your skin to the heat of the sun, it hurts very badly. And Allah said, فَنُبِذَ بِالْعَرَىٰ When he was taken out of the whale, when he was casted out of the whale, it was on a barren shore. It was in a, in a land that, that has no trees. وَهُوَ سَقِيمٌ And he was sick. Then the mercy of Allah comes. Allah said, وَأَنْبَتْنَا عَلَيْهِ شَجَرَةً مِّنْ يَقْطِينٌ And we caused a plant of gourd to grow over him. The, Allah ordered the plant to come up and cover him with its shades. And gourd is all the plants that have big leaves but have no big trunks. It's usually fast growing plants. It's the things that like uh, pumpkin uh, and, and uh, in Arabic language called al-qara, al-kusa, etc. This is the gourds. It's a family of plants called the gourd plants. And in, according to the Arabs, everything called yaqteen is, belongs to that family. It doesn't have to be pumpkin or melon but it's in that family of plants because it has huge leaves and the leaves are very uh, soft. So when they touch the skin, they don't irritate the skin. So Allah chose that cure for his skin. And the ulama said he would eat from the fruits of it and he repaired his body that way. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَأَرْسَلْنَاهُ إِلَى مِئَةِ أَلْفٍ أَوْ يَزِيدُونَ and we send him to a hundred thousand or more. And there is also a difference of opinion whether he went back to the very same village, to the very same city that he was in, or he went to another city, but the majority said he went back to his hometown. Because something else happened there. Now we were with Yunus and we don't know what happened, we know, but we didn't say what happened to his hometown, to the town that he was sent, to guide. When he left, they were doomed. It was a done deal, as far as he knew. That they would be tormented, and they will be annihilated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's gone. Now, Allah said, وَأَرْسَلْنَاهُ إِلَى مِئَةِ أَلْفٍ أَوْ يَزِيدُونَ He came back to see more than 100,000 believers. When he was in that town, there was not one of them 
No one followed Eunice. He did not, the whole time when he was calling for them, he would have nobody to respond to him. But when he came back, Allah said, more than 100,000 believers, the entire village, the entire town, فَآمَنُوا They believed. فَمَتَّعْنَاهُمْ إِلَى حين. So we gave them enjoyment for a while. That torment did not hit him. And they continued to have their life and their prosperity until the natural death came to him. إِلَى حين, Until that one, that while. So, now we go to the, to the last verse in our story, and that is in Surah Yunus. Now, Surah Yunus is called Surah Yunus, right? Why is it called Yunus? And, and Hafib can tell you so how many prophets are mentioned there. Many. Nuh, Musa, Harun, Ibrahim, right? But it's called Surah Yunus. And the story of Yunus is not in Surah Yunus. The story of Yunus himself is not in Surah Yunus. Safad and Anbiya, that's it. But in Surah Yunus, this is the story of his people that he left behind. Now that's an honor for Yunus. Allah gave him a whole surah in the final revelation, his words of Allah, the Quran under his name. And in that surah, Allah does not mention the shortcomings of Yunus alayhi salam at all. See the beauty how this is set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The shortcomings of Yunus are mentioned in the Safat, Anbiya, and Al-Qalam. As a lesson for Prophet Muhammad, for humanity, for the dua, for the callers of Allah. But in Surah Yunus itself, no shortcomings of Yunus. It's also only talking about his people about the people of Yunus. How does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say about their people in Surah Yunus? فَلَوْلَا كَانَتْ قَرِيَةٌ آمَنَتْ فَنَفَعَهَا إِيمَانُهَا إِلَّا قَوْمَ يُونَسْ لَمَّا آمَنُوا كَشَفْنَا عَنْهُمْ عَذَابَ الْخِزِيِ فِي الدُّنْيَا فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَمَتَّعْنَاهُمْ إِلَى حين. Allah said, was there any town, any community that believed after seeing the punishment and its faith at that moment saved it from the punishment? Usually, what Allah says here, لَوْلَا كَانَتْ قَرْيَةٌ آمَنَتْ فَنَفَعَهَا إِيمَانُهَا The story that comes before that immediately, Surah, you know, the Qur'an, you have to really read it in, in uh, harmony with each other. It's a, it's a kitab al-muhkam. It's a very tightly knitted book. So, the story of Yunus comes after the story of Fir'aun. And in that particular chapter, in that particular surah, it is the very final moments of Fir'aun's life. Right? How does it work? How does it go? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَلَمَّا أَدْرَكَهُ الْغَرَقُ قَالْ فَلَمَّا أَدْرَكَهُ الْغَرَقُ قَالْ آمَنْتُ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا الَّذِي آمَنَتْ بِهِ بَنُوا إِسْرَائِيلُ وَأَنَا مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ These are the final words of Fir'aun. Words of Iman. آمَنْتُ He says, آمَنْتُ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا الَّذِي آمَنَتْ بِهِ بَنِي وَإِسْرَائِيلِ I believe there is no deity other than the, the Lord that the people of Israel believe in. وَأَنَا مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ And I am a Muslim. He saw with his own eyes the final torment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah, what does Allah say? How does Allah respond to that? الآن? Now? Now when you have disobeyed before, how many signs Allah has given Pharaoh? Nine. Nine major signs. And with everyone he knew exactly what he was dealing with. Even the sorcerers that Pharaoh brought to challenge Musa, they all believed. And he killed them for their belief. Al-Asa, Al-Yad, al qumma al al all of these Adam, right? Adab al rijs We'll study all of that, inshallah, as we reflect on the story of Musa soon, inshallah. But Pharaoh was, was given all of these signs one after the other. And he continued to reject arrogantly, would not believe. 
And then at the final moment, he said, Anam lal Muslimin, I'm one of the believers. Then immediately after that, Allah gives you the story of the people of Yunus. But they were in a sort of similar position, weren't they? They rejected Yunus, rejected Yunus, rejected Yunus, until the very final moment, Yunus said, a torment is coming to you and I'm leaving. Okay? End of story, you are going to face your punishment with Allah. Then they believed after Yunus left. And Allah said, that is an exception. That is no village, no, no qariya. And qariya doesn't really mean village. If you go to the root of the word qariya in the Arabic language, now in this common modern Arabic it means a small village, but it really doesn't mean that. Mecca is called Ummul Qura, the mother of all Qura. Qariya means a place where you can find Qira. Qira is food. And food is, if you're a traveler, you only find it in the settlements, in places that are towns or, you know, they have extra, they have abundance. If you're usually in a, in a going through the land in ancient time, you will not find food everywhere. Abundance of food that you can have, buy, or be, be, you know, be hosted with it. But in a qarya, you will find that. So in towns and settlements, it means it's an urban place. That's what qarya means. So, this qarya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, there is not one town that would benefit that benefit from believing after they after they saw the adab, after they saw the torment, after the torment had befall upon them, except the people of Yunus. And if you, you have to really read the whole surah of Yunus to understand this. And I encourage every one of us to do that. It starts by knowing, by saying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Hakim. Allah has ultimate wisdom. And Allah does whatever He wants. And we have to trust in the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah knows the heart of Fir'aun. Allah knows the hearts of the people of Yunus. And Allah would bestow, it would accept the faith, the, the words of the people of Yunus, even in the very final moment. And He would not accept those words from Fir'aun alayhi salam. Because He is all-knowing and He is all-wise. And a believer, a Muslim, has to believe in that. We don't question Allah. We don't question Allah's acceptance and Allah's behavior and Allah's hikmah. It is up to Him. And the ulama said, and another explanation of this, is they believed just before, in the very nick of time, before torment actually hit them. But had the torment hit them already, it would have been too late. But they, in the very final moment, believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and, and even there's some description in the Tabari and other books and how they, you know, they used to transgress over upon each other and steal money and they would just go give their the rights back to their people. And he said, if one person build a wall and he has stolen one brick, put it in that wall, he would turn the whole, tore down the whole wall. He would not leave any illegal money in his position. They had absolutely complete repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah lifted that calamity. Allah said, When they believed, we removed from them the torment of disgrace in the life, in this world. And permitted them to enjoy this life until the time, which means the time of the death. And that's the lesson that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to his beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The final lesson comes in Surah Al-Qalam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said at the end of Surah Al-Qalam, فَاصْبِرْ لِحُكْمِ Rabbik." So as you, ya Muhammad, as you go through this da'wah, and as you suffer through your call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are harmed, you are injured, you are persecuted, your companions are being tortured and killed. The Prophet ﷺ himself was beaten. And no one believed from Quraysh. This is a Makki surah, right? Yunus is also a Makki surah. It was a hard time in the life of Prophet Muhammad. And a handful of people of Quraysh would believe for the majority of the time of the Dawah of Prophet ﷺ, 13 years. 
he would spend among those people. And no one would follow him except the few, as sabiqun That's why we hold them in high reverence. So Allah says, فَاصْبِرْ لِحُكْمِ رَبِّكَ So be patient for the decision of your Lord. And in another place, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also recommends patience to Prophet Muhammad and said, and that's in Surah Al-Tul, فَاصْبِرْ لِحُكْمِ رَبِّكَ فَإِنَّكَ بِأَعْيُنِنَا Be patient, accept the trials of Allah, you are in our eyes. وَلَا تَكُنْ كَصَاحِبِ الْحُوتِ and don't be like the one with the whale or the fish, that is Yunus alayhi salam. إِذْ نَادَى وَهُوَ مكذوم, When he cried to us, when he was in deep sorrow. Now al-kazum, al-kazimin al ghayb remember that, that word kazama. Kazama is just to have it inside. What was Yunus, what was he holding inside? What was he, what was burning him inside? is his lack of patience, his regret of what he did. Only if he, I mean, how many times he would think in the belly of that, only if I stayed another day, if only if I stayed. Well, you know, he stayed with his people as long as he wanted to stay, and then in the final moment. So Allah said, don't rush. Don't rush the success. Allah works on his own agenda. He has his own calendar. Our job is to have sabr. And don't resent the test of Allah. Now we can think that this is only for Yunus and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Well, they are amongst the best of creation. We need to learn. This is the lessons that we take from these stories. Is sometimes we get a little bit too rushy. We want to hasten al-faraj. We want to hasten... We, we've had enough, we can't take no more. Allah said, that's not how a believer should behave. Allah will send the victory and will lift the calamity when He sees that's fitting. It's not us that we decide. You know, we want you know, this and we want that and why is this happening to us? We don't deserve it. We say, la ilaha illallah. And all of these things are happening to us. I said, فَصْبِرْ لِحُكْمِ رَبِّكَ Be patient. Persevere. It is Allah's word. It is Allah's wisdom. And you have to trust that. إِذْ نَادَ وَهُوَ مَقْذُومٌ That the, the Yunus cried out to Allah when he was in deep sorrow. And then Allah said, لَوْ لَا أَنْتَ دَارَكَهُ نِعْمَةٌ مِّنْ رَبِّكَ لَنُبِذَ بِالْعَرَاءِ وَهُوَ مَذْمُومٌ Had it not the grace from his Lord reached him, he would indeed have been left in the stomach of the fish, but we forgave him. So when he was cast off, while well, he was to be blamed. So Allah says in that verse, is the mercy of Allah reached Yunus in the belly of the Hud because of his supplication. And the mercy of Allah reached him also after he was cast out of the belly of the Hud because of his repentance. But all of that was accompanied by deep sorrow and regret and guilt. So Allah says, don't get into that position, O Muhammad. But then Allah said, فَاجْتَبَاهُ رَبُّهُ Then his Lord chose him. His Lord repented upon him. His Lord brought him back. فَجَعَلَهُ مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ And made him of the righteous. And in the hadith, very authentic hadith, as narrated in Al-Bukhari, Muslim and Ahmed, you know, the three major pillars of hadith. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said on the authority of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma anahu qal la yambaghi li abdin ay yaqul ana khayrun min Yunus ibn Matta He said not a slave of Allah should say I am better than Yunus ibn Matta. Allah has given us the example of Yunus but you should never think for a moment that any any slave, any righteous slave of Allah is better than Yunus ibn Matta. And this Anna, in this hadith, this I, there are two different interpretation of it. That no righteous person should say, I am better. I would have not have done that. I would have stayed. You know, some, some, you know, always we have those Monday morning quarterbacks. 
that have 2020 hindsight, I would not have done that. I would have stayed there. Allah, Allah said, stay, I'd stay. But Yunus didn't. And it's a clear admonishment from the Prophet Muhammad said, no one should say I would have not have done that. Because you don't know what he had to go through. And Allah said, فَجَعَلَهُ مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ And Allah honored Yunus. And he has a surah in the Quran named after him. And Allah says, إِنَّ يُونُسَ لَمِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ in, in a huge emphasis in the Arabic language, by using inna and by using the lam, lamina. That is certainly, he is one of our messengers. Allah has said, he is mine. You know, he's proud of him. But yet, Allah tells you that this is a mistake. And a slave of Allah should be aware of those mistakes. But the second interpretation of Anna of me is the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet is saying in one interpretation of this hadith, and that's both in Fath al-Bari and in Sharh Sahih Muslim, that La yambaghi li abdin ayakul ana, that no slave of Allah should say Muhammad is better than Yunus. What does that mean? Only Allah has the right to say this Prophet is better than that Prophet, or this Prophet is more worthy than that Prophet. But we don't say that. لا نفرق بين أحد من رسله قالوا سمعنا وأطعنا. We are not in a position to say this is better than that, and he's, you know, except what we know of the Hadith, what we know of the Quran, that we we stop there. It is not a a, a job of a slave of Allah to start putting high and lows among the messengers of Allah. It's only Allah Subhanahu wa Taala that can do that. But the Hadith serves a very important purpose that no one should say, I would not have done that. We don't think that, that the weakness or this type of, of lack of patience, it can affect the righteous, the most righteous people. And Allah gives us that example to make us understand that it can happen to the best of you. And Yunus is definitely the best of us. And you hear sometimes, you know, people criticize Adam alayhi salam. Well, you should not have eaten, you know, <laughs> from that tree. You should never say that. You never fall into those tricks of shaitan. <laughs> we are created out of weakness and we do far worse things. Far worse things than these righteous chosen people of Allah. So we should never fall into that. Now, finally, I would like to to finish this with the beautiful reflection on the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, on the sunnah of the story of Yunus ibn Matta. Nothing in the Quran or in the seerah is by accident. It is all by the absolute wisdom and planning and plotting of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When was our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when was he reminded of Yunus? Right? <laughs> the worst day in the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. According to the hadith that is solid, Aisha asked him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam if the worst day that he had was the day of Uhud. It's a very hard day for the Prophet. Lost closest companions, lost his uncle. Muslims were really wounded. He said, no, it was not the hardest day. The hardest day was when I went to a Taif. When the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went to a ta'if, he left Mecca with a very weak group of companions. He just lost the protection of Abu Talib. He just lost the comfort within his house of Khadija, radiallahu anha. And the persecution was at his, its worst. And the Prophet thought that he should leave Mecca and try to explore Different places take his da'wah, otherwise the da'wah is at a risk of being completely perished. The da'wah could have ended the way it was going at that time. Allah says, Fasbir, right? just persevere. Then he went to a ta'if, and at a ta'if the Prophet ﷺ was faced with absolute rejection. They stoned his face, they stoned his feet, his feet وسلم, how much he taken for this da'wah. And he was chased out of the Ta'if with the stones and the ridicule of the people of the Ta'if. And 
he took rest in an orchard in a place, and a slave was there, a slave, a Christian slave. And he saw this man being tormented and chased out of a pot and obviously in a difficult situation. And that slave was Adas. So Adas, after the permission of the uh, owners of this orchard, and it was a, a vine place, it was a place of grapes, but he said, take, take a, you know, some grapes and take it to that man. So he takes this grapes and he goes, puts it before the Prophet ﷺ and he said, have some. You know, have a little, they had human, some human uh, mercy upon this stranger that's in their town. So the Prophet put his hand and he said, Bismillah, the name of Allah. And Adas looked at him and he said, هذا الكلام ما يقوله أهل هذه البلاد. Adas was a foreigner. And he said, these words, they're not said by the people of this land. They don't say that when they eat. And the Prophet ﷺ said, ومن أي البلاد أنت? Where are you from then? You're saying that the people of this country don't do that. Where are you from? Ya yeah, Adas. And he said, أنا نصراني. I'm a Christian. وأنا رجل من أهل نينوى. And I am a man from the town of Nainawa. Nainawa is Nineveh. Currently, it's in the site of Al Musul. It's, it's on the other side of uh, other side of the river, in uh, the city of Musul in Iraq, northern Iraq. <coughs> and at that time, just to digress a little bit, Nainawa and Musul are not really part of Iraq. Iraq is only southern Iraq as we know it today. Everything northern of that is called Al Jazeera. So that's where our Musul is. So anyway, the Prophet ﷺ, when, when he said, I'm from Nainawa, the Prophet ﷺ said, مِنْ قَرْيَةِ الرَّجُلِ الصَّالِحِ يُونُسُ بْنُ Matta. So you're from the town of the righteous man, Yunus ibn Matta. And Adda said, وَمَا يُدْرِكَ مَا يُونُسُ بْنُ Matta." And how do you know about Yunus? How have you heard of Yunus? He knows that people in Arabia don't know anything about Yunus ibn Matta. And the Prophet ﷺ said, ذَلِكَ أَخِي That is my brother. He said, كَانَ نَبِيًّا وَأَنَا نَبِيًّا He was a prophet and I am a prophet. He was a messenger and I'm a messenger. So Adas, the slave, he started kissing the hands and the feet and the head of the Prophet ﷺ. And those owners of the uh, orchard, they were sitting there and they see, you know, they send them with a little bit of grapes and here's their slave is about to uh, rebel. He's just uh, kissing the hands and he would not do that to them. And he certainly loves that, that person just after a few words. And then he said, come here. What are you doing there? And he said, أخبرني بأمر ما يعلمه إلا نبي. He told me about something that no one but a messenger of Allah would have known. And that is the story of Yunus alayhi salam. And the Prophet was reminded of that in that hardest day. Because then the Prophet had to make a choice. Go back to Mecca, endure Mecca, sabr, or leave, end of da'wah, bring on the punishment to the people of Mecca. Because the angels came to the Prophet ﷺ and they said, now they deserve, because the Prophet was not allowed back in Mecca. The Prophet at that after he's going back from his trip to Atayf, it wasn't like he went on a journey and coming back, welcome Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No, he's, they said you cannot come back. You cannot enter Mecca. You just leave, stay out there. And he only could come after the protection of a pagan. Right? Mut'am ibn Adi. He protected the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, how would you let this noble man of Quraysh not even go back to his house. He took it out of, you know, just nobility. He was not a believer and he died a Catholic. He died a non-believer. But that's, you see the weak, the, 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 the situation of Muslims and the situation of Islam and the situation of the Prophet wasallam at that time, yet he was given a choice that now you can just put the mountains on top of them. Let the torment come on, this, on these people people that stoned their prophet, tormented him, 
ridiculed him and rejected his call. They were worthy of the punishment at that time. And then the Prophet وسلم, he was the best teacher and also the best student. He is the best teacher to humanity and he is the best student of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He learned the lesson of Yunus. He said, no. I will be patient. Fasbir li hukmi rabbik. Be patient for the decision of thy Lord. He said, we will be patient, we'll endure. Might, maybe one day, a believing heart can come out of this village of Mecca. Maybe somebody will come out of those people that would say, la ilaha illallah. And that was your Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. From the house of Abu Jahl came Ikrima. From the, ha the house of Umayyah ibn Khalaf came Safwan ibn Umayyah. From the house of Al-Walid ibn Al-Mughira came Khalid ibn Al-Walid. From the house of Utbah came Abu Huzaifa. All these houses that were staunch enemies of the Prophet وسلم, came some of the best banners for Islam. And that is the lesson that the Prophet وسلم, took from the story of Yunus السلام. Inshallah, with that we'll stop. And um, anybody has a comment or a question, we can answer that. From Al-Ta'if, Muhammad ibn Qasim al thaqafi yes. Right. Thaqafi from Thaqif, yes, he's from Al-Ta'if. Muhammad ibn Qasim al thaqafi And we can either do another story, or we can have a 25-minute break. <laughs> it's up to you all. Yunus, right? Would you recite the beginning of it, inshallah? And you see in the beginning, Allah says, starts it with really, I mean, a lot of these long verses focus on the beginning and focus on the end. And you will get the theme, you will get what you really need to, to, to try to extrapolate out of it. And Allah says, Tilka ayatu kitab al hakim. Not kitab mubin, not kitab kareem, hakim. Allah knows what He's doing. Allah is hakim. And this book has hikmah in it. And it tells you the two contradicting. The, the apparent contradictions of the two, two stories of the people of Fir'aun and the people of Yunus. But then the hikmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it all jive together. Makes you understand that sometimes you see things and you might not understand why they're happening. Why does Allah make you a believer and not make that other person? Who might on the outward look like a really nice person, a generous person. I mean, we are surrounded by really good people that are not giving guidance, right? And Allah says, it is His wisdom, He knows. And in that, Allah knows where He puts His message. Allah knows how He would choose this, the, the believers. Allah knows who He who accept from and who would not accept from. And that, that whole theme is way beyond us, is way above us. The human, and then in Surah Yunus, Allah said, if Allah wants, He would make everyone a believer, correct? So, Sha'Allahu la ja'al had, how was it? Sha'Allahu la had an nasa jami'an, or I, I don't want to say words that are not true, but, uh, right, but, but in, that's in Surah Yunus as well. And people would say, you know, why? Why would Allah do this? And why would Allah don't do that? And Surah Yunus answers all of these things. Why would Allah put a calamity here and lift it here, there? Why would Allah give guidance to this person and not to that person? Why would Allah give power to non-believers and take power away from believers? You know, why, why, why did this happen? Why should the Prophet be stoned? 
the most beloved person to Allah, the best of creation. Why he should suffer that way? Right? Allah said this is hikmah. You know, you go with it, you may not, may or may not understand it. What you understand is good, what you don't understand, leave it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that was, that's really exactly the theme of Surah Yunus. It has a lot about iman and qada and qada, about destiny and predestiny, and iman in the ordainment of Allah. Surah Yunus is very deep. Surah Yunus is a very, very deep surah. And uh, obviously the time and the situation does not allow for a full reflection. But it is one thing that we need probably to go back and just try to, to extract some of those absolute wisdoms from there. But you see, Yunus himself is not mentioned, his story is not mentioned in Yunus. It's his people. Qawm Yunus. And yet the whole story is named, the whole surah is named after Yunus alayhi salam. To get your attention. You know, these names are not arbitrary. You know, when you say Surah Ibrahim, Ibrahim is mentioned in so many surah. Why this one? You know, and yet Musa is mentioned in so, so many, and there's no Surah Musa. <laughs> right. These things are, are to get your attention to focus on a certain thing within the surah. And inshallah, maybe one time we can do that and, and just go over some of these things. Yeah. I'm sorry. The dua. It is in Al-Bukhari. Um, yeah. It will be on the website. I mean, uh, I already sent the slides to Brother Jamal. Yeah, you can download it and copy it. It will be on the uh, website for this, for this society. I, I did not find, I don't know of any prescribed number in the books of hadith. Uh, that's the answer. I, I'm not aware of it. Anybody is? Uh, as much as you can. A lot of, the, you see a lot of the uh, scholars, they end their dua with it. And sometimes they repeat it three times, just with their, you know, loving, just uh, Allah loves the, the uh, odd numbers. So, la ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntum min al as much as you can. And, and the Prophet was asked, was that, you know, when Allah said, نَجَّيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْغَمْ We saved him from that distress. And they said, is it for, just because he said that it is for Yunus, he said, complete the verse. وَكَذَلِكَ نُنْجِي الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And so we also save the believers. It is a, it's a gift from Allah. This dua is a gift. Whenever you are in bad shape, distress, sit by yourself. It's my prescription. It's not from a scholar. And, uh, and just, you know, have a moment with Allah. Say, la ilaha, mean, mean it, really. Just and reflect on the meanings of what you're saying. La ilaha illa an. Tawheed. Subhanak. Exalt your Lord. Show his glory, then show your humbleness. Glorify him and humble yourself. Inni kuntum nazalimin. And it's the same, I just wanted to bring Sayyid al-Istighfar because it goes around along the same parallels. Really the same theme. The same thing that saved Adam. رَبَّنَا إِنَّا ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا وَإِنْ لَمْ تَغْفِرْ لَنَا وَتَرْحَمْنَا لَنَكُونَنَّا مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ Allah tells you this is what will save you from the hardest positions you are in, from the most difficulties you are in, is these steps. Now if you want to say that dua, say this dua, it's Allah, what Allah gives you, what Allah opens for you. But uh, it's a beautiful and simple and short dua. The most important thing in all of these du'a, and all of these remembrances, and all of these adhkar, is to come from the heart. You know, I, remember, I always mention the story of Ali radiallahu anhu when he passed by somebody, he said, astaghfirullah, 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 astaghfirullah. He said, your, your astaghfirullah needs astaghfar. You need to ask forgiveness for this. Because, you know, just the tongue is just saying that, and the heart is, you know, he might be thinking of his family, and the car needs oil, and subhanAllah, 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 subhanAllah. And the mind is somewhere else completely, right? People just, you know, do this and tasbih and all that. The heart has to be present. The tongue reflects only what's in the heart. But, we, you know, sometimes if you put yourself in that position, don't stop tasbih. Just take a moment 
stop and refocus. You know, don't say, I'm not, I'm not, I'll make tasbih later. That's the shaitan telling you, stop, you know, don't do it. Because inshallah, there's benefit in, uh, in everything. Good habits are good. But uh, always the heart has to be there. And when we make the dua, we shouldn't just parrot it. We should know what we're saying. And the heart has to feel those words. That's what I'm saying, that we should know, we should understand the meaning of the words, understand what we're saying. And a lot of these dua are very, very short. You know, when the Prophet ﷺ said two words, SubhanAllah wa bihamdi, SubhanAllah al-Azim. Can't get simpler than that, right? I mean, anybody can say that. If they put, you know, we, we all learn two and three languages you know, in this country. It's easy to say those words. And the word SubhanAllah is so simple, so easy to say, so easy to understand. And Allah puts a lot of benefit in it. There's, not, there's no hadith to say that. That's what I'm saying is, there is no authentic hadith to say, you should say, la ilaha illallah subhanaka, and you can do no zalimeen. There's no hadith that she says, I'm not aware of it anyway. I don't know it. Right, those are hadith. Yeah, that is a hadith. Right, those are hadith. What I mentioned on the numbers, there are hadith. Like the, when the Prophet said, in astaghfirullah fi liyawmin sab'een, am akthar min sab'een mara, more than 70 times I say astaghfirullah. In another hadith, he say 100 times. Okay, all of that is just to give us all of these tips. And unfortunately, you see people go and throw and go to, to, to um, supplications and remembrances that are not from the sunnah. And they get busy with it. And they take their time and they learn it and memorize it. And, and it's better to go to the hadith, to go to what the Prophet used to say, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because that's the best good. I mean, that's the, that's the best thing you can do. Right. Right, right, right. There are certain uh, certain phrases and remembrances from Allah subhanahu from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi that are known. I mean, there's those books, al Hasn al Hasin, the Fortress of the Muslim, and all of that. And many of them are referenced, so you know which hadith has prescribed that and how it came about. Yes. No, the Surah Yunus was revealed before, before that time. But uh, the, he was reminded of Yunus himself. I mean, this slave came to the Prophet wasallam, and he said, I'm from Nainawa. And Nainawa immediately brought Yunus to the mind of the Prophet wasallam, And with it brought, what I meant, brought the story of Yunus. And Yunus was in that predicament that the Prophet wasallam was in at that time. So it was a reminder not to fall in the mistakes that Yunus made at that point. And the Prophet didn't, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in all humbleness, the Prophet would say then, no one should say that I am better than Yunus in the Mecca. No one should, you know, because the Prophet learned from him. And the Prophet would say this about Yusuf, he would say this about Ibrahim. He saw all of these hadith, he said about Ibrahim, نحن أولى بالشك من Ibrahim. When people say, when Ibrahim alayhi salam said, Rabbi arini kayfa tuhi al-mawta. Oh Allah, show me how you revive the death, and the dead. And uh, then Allah said, take four birds and cut them in pieces and then throw different pieces on four mountains and then call them and they'll come to you. Some people might think that Ibrahim was doubting that Allah will resurrect the dead. And the Prophet explained those in these hadith. He said, nah, he said, we would have been more worthy of doubt than Ibrahim. Ibrahim had absolute faith. Allah said, have you not believed? And Ibrahim, what did he say? Yes, but to, so my heart would be, you know, absolutely certain. And the same thing with Yusuf. The Prophet, in all humbleness, he said, if the man that wants to take me out of prison came to me, Yusuf refused before his innocence been uh, declared or exonerated. The Prophet said, I would have gotten out of prison at that time. <laughs> I would not have waited. The humbleness of the Prophet وسلم, his truthfulness, his honesty, and his admitting the, the, uh, the uh, character and the excellence of the other Prophets. And especially with Yunus, because what do we know about Yunus? What do we know about Yunus? We know only this story. 
Do we know how much he suffered for the way of Allah? Do we know how much he was injured in the way of Allah? Do you know what he had to endure and what he had to go through with his people? We don't know any of that. And the Prophet said, don't, don't pass judgment on Yunus. Because Allah brings this story for this lesson. It doesn't mean that you should start thinking of Yunus as the you know, black sheep of the family of the prophets. It's not that. He's a glorified prophet. He's a revered prophet. And we should always send the blessings upon him and upon all the prophets of Allah. And no one should start favoring one prophet over another. And say, you know, Yunus and, and uh, for example, you know, Musa, whatever. It's, uh, it's up to Allah. Allah told us about Ulul Azim, the prophets of strong resolve, told, resolve, told us about the ones that are put in high reverence, but yet said, لا نفرق بين أحد الرسل. We do not favor one over the other. It's Allah that does that. One time, this is, this is an authentic hadith. One Jewish person was, had a conflict with a Muslim person in Medina. And the Jewish person said, وَالَّذِي اصْطَفَى مُوسَى عَلَى الْعَالَمِينَ That who chose Musa over everyone else. So the Muslims take his hand and slap him on the face. My prophet. Your prophet? No, my prophet is the one who chose him, not your prophet. So the Jewish person goes and complains to the Prophet ﷺ. He said, I said that, and he slapped me on the face. And the Prophet got angry with the Muslim. He said, you, 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 should, you don't do that. Let him say whatever he wants to do. Allah is the one that chooses people over another. And then he recited, the Prophet said a hadith, he said, when I resurrect on the day of judgment, I see Musa at the legs of the throne before me. He said, I, I get up and I open my eyes and I see Musa mutaalliqun bi qawa'im al He said, so how do you slap him on the face and you don't know anything? He said, leave that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is really an important lesson for all of us, is we should not get into this. I mean, even the ulama said, you don't get into this between sahaba. You don't say this sahabi is better than that sahabi. And you know, it's leave that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The ulama said, you know, this is a fit that happened a fitna among them. And people say, Mu'awiyah Amr ibn al-As is better, or Abdullah ibn Abbas is better, because that was in this camp. That's not our job. And it's really important that we stay away from these things. When it comes to the prophets of Allah, it's even more important. I actually looked it up in Lisan al-Arab. Lisan al-Arab is um, one of the um, Ummahat al-Kutub, the, the mothers of all books, not to paraphrase anybody, um, for the Arabic language. And um, Allah, uh, the, the, he said, Sabbaha tasbihan, it is only for Allah. And he said, Sabbaha salla, meaning to, to make salah, tasbih. وَقَالَ سُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ And he says, Subhanallah. And then he said, تَسْبِيحُ اللَّهِ تَسْبِحَانَ اللَّهِ تَنْزِيهًا لَهُ عَنِ الصَّاحِبَةِ وَالْوَلَدِ وَهُوَ عَلَمٌ لِلْتَسْبِيحِ لَا يُصَرَّفُ وَلَا يُتَصَرَّفُ وَإِنَّمَا يَكُونُ مَصْدَرِيًّا عَلَى الْمَنْصُوبًا مَصْوُبًا عَلَى الْمَصْدَرِيًّا And to translate all of that, meaning this, this word is very specific to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's always subhana. You cannot say subhani or subhanu. You can't change the haraka. You can't change the movement at the end of the word subhana. Always to uh, subhanallah. Right, and he said, oh, and, and then he said, inni ubarri'ullaha min as su'i bara'a. I exonerate Allah, and I elevate Allah, and I exalt Allah above any shortcoming, any possibility of anything that is not good to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then also he said, ma'nahu sur'atu ilayhi wal khiffatu fi ta'atih, meaning to hasten and do our best in obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's really a long explanation, I don't want to bore with it. But to answer the question in a nutshell, subhanAllah is specific to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you want to exalt a slave of Allah, like a king or a president, to say subhanak, you made shirk. Okay, you, you have really committed a major capital sin. You don't say to a person, if you want to exalt someone other than Allah, you cannot use that word. Subhanak is specific to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Such as few names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like Al-Azim, Al-Rahman, you know, there are things that are specific to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that cannot be shared with any of his slaves. Yeah. So, um, the short story of uh, the believer of Yasin has to wait 
obviously. Uh, and we'll see what we need to do because if we start with the story of Musa alayhi salam, we cannot really inject any other stories in there. So next session we'll either go for a few short stories or we start with uh, the story of Musa alayhi salam, inshallah. So jazakumullah khair. And I think, yeah, I think there will be time change next week. But we, um, what is the plan? Jazakumullah khair. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين